Good morning, everyone. This is our worship service for Sunday, March the 29th, 2020. I hope that you're enjoying the, the time we get to share online. Um, it's been a whole new experience for all of us, but um, it, I, I've enjoyed it. Um, it is a little strange not getting to see everybody. Um, I spoke with some of the session via Zoom, which is a video conferencing platform the other night, um, just to get caught up and kind of make sure everybody knew how to use the platform. And so it was nice to see everyone's face, but I have to admit it, it has been a little strange. It's been you know a couple weeks now and we don't know how much longer it's gonna be, but so far so good. And we'll just keep on keeping on. Um, I know elders have been calling folks and trying to keep in touch and, and we'll continue to do so. So if there's anything you need, if there's anything you need to talk about, please feel free to call one of them, call me, call Ann. Um, we would be happy to talk and try to help you find a solution. If you've got the, the order of worship that Ann sent out, you'll see there's a, a few announcements here up at the top. Um, if anyone else is interested in, in helping keep in touch with those who don't have an online presence, with those who you know don't have email, don't have Facebook, those kinds of things, um, get in touch with Ann or call the church office and she can get you the list of names and contact info, phone numbers and things, so that so that you can help us do that. Um, it's really important for all of us to, to try to do as much as we can. And if that's something you're interested in, please let us know because we'd be happy to do that. Uh, the scholarship committee wants to remind everyone to encourage high school seniors with a connection to CUPC to complete the application for the faith scholarship. Electronic copies are available on the website and on Facebook. If you want a paper copy, call the church office and Ann can get that for you. Uh, the deadline for applications has been extended a couple weeks since everything's kind of been in flux and, and everybody's still trying to figure out what they're doing here. Um, so the deadline's been extended to Wednesday, April the 15th, but that is a hard deadline. There are a few birthdays and anniversaries this week, as we noted. One of them is Miss Melody, who's having a birthday on the 31st, so happy birthday to her. And also, yes, my husband and I have a wedding anniversary this week. We're the big wedding anniversary coming up on Friday. Um, we've joked over the years that some of our anniversaries have been a lot of fun, and some of them have been truly horrible. And so we're hoping that this one falls somewhere in the middle. <laughs> But it should be, we'll have a good time. We might get some takeout. If it's a nice day, we might go for a ride in the car. I don't know. We'll figure out something to do. I'll try to not do housework that day. I think he'll appreciate that more than anything. So uh, also don't forget the Minute for Mission, the One Great Hour of Sharing that's coming up. Um, the One Great Hour of Sharing offerings usually taken through Easter. Um, there's a, a link on there on the, the bulletin to be able to you can go straight online and do that or if you want to you know put it in, a, in your check and just note that on the check you can do that and send it into the church that's fine too um, we can still forward things on to to presbyterian on to the denomination for that um, that'll be a really important offering going forward because the presbyterian disaster assistance is already opening up millions of dollars out of their reserves um, for grants to churches right now to be able to help them get through this time when folks are not meeting. So being able to, to help them replenish some of that will be really important. I think that's it on what I have for announcements. So let's go ahead and if you wanna follow along, let's begin with our call to worship. Come, let us give thanks to God. We gather to praise the one who strengthens the weak and hears the prayers of the forgotten. Come, let us give thanks to Christ. We gather to sing of the one who calls us to serve those who are hungry and alone. Come, let us give thanks to the Spirit. We gather to exalt the one who teaches us to love not only our family and friends, but the stranger among us. Let's continue with our first hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
all enjoyed Rebecca's playing. It was great that we were able to include her in this, which is why we're not doing Facebook Live. Um, that seemed to have too much possibility for issues. So we got her to record and, and send us the recordings so that we can, we can include that in our worship. Let's continue with our call to confession. Longing for the touch of God, we cry out. Humbled by the awareness of our human nature and brokenness, we bring our prayers of confession to God, praying together. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us, open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Take comfort in the assurance that even those things that are hidden from memory or are too deep for our words are not beyond God's forgiving love. God who knows us completely bestows pardon and peace. Thanks be to God. We'll continue with the Gloria Patri. reading this morning is the Gospel of Mark chapter 13 verses 1 through 8 and then 24 through 37. As Jesus came out of the temple one of his disciples said to him look teacher what large stones and what large buildings then Jesus asked him do you see these great buildings not one stone will be left here upon another all will be thrown down when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead you astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. And then at verse 24. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth 
the meditation of all our hearts. Be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, as often happens in our narrative lectionary, there's a lot of things going on here, especially in Mark, because Mark moves so quickly through everything. There's a lot going on here, and these are actually some of the last things that Jesus says to his disciples before the whole cycle of, the, of his final day to two days, you know, the, the final passion happens. Um, right after this is the start of chapter 14, where we begin you know, looking for the place to stay and look, you know, finding the upper room and that that whole cycle begins right after these verses. So this is in a sense the last thing he's telling them before the passion. The big thing going on here, of course, is prophecy. Now we tend to have trouble with prophetic oracles, with prophetic works, because we tend to think of them as predicting the future. We demand that, you know, experts give us predictions about the future, even when we know there's a lot of possibilities, a lot of variation in what's going on. We know that that's a possibility, but we still want accurate predictions. Could anyone have predicted where we are now? Of course not, not totally. Sure, there were signs and there were things we should have paid better attention to and we didn't, but to know exactly what things are going to be, we put too much on prophetic writing when we do that. Old Testament prophecy had a really different framework for how it was, how statements were made about the future. It wasn't, you know, like going to the fortune teller. That's not what we're doing here. Old Testament prophecy was much more a diagnosis of a moral problem. It was talking about the spiritual health of the people. It really had nothing to do with telling the future in this wide open format. It was looking at a narrow slice of what was going on and saying, okay, you keep this up and this is what's going to happen. If you find a way to turn from where you're going and, and get yourself back on the path God wants you on, then you're going to be okay. It was more the intention was more to promote repentance and reform it was about getting the people back on track even though most people rejected it the prophets were so often rejected the destruction only happens because the people fail to listen it's basically that last warning it's the big flashing yellow light saying you need to slow down and stop what you're doing and look at this and turn and change your path and if you don't, well, you're going to get what you deserve. You've been warned. Not exactly fortune telling. It's a very different idea. It's much more instructive. It's much more about repentance. Now this particular section, Mark 13, is often referred to as the little apocalypse because this whole chapter kind of has that apocalyptic literature feel. They're very similar to other end times writings, things such as the second half of the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation. And in some respects they are, and in some respects they're not. This is more what sometimes gets called persecution literature rather than apocalyptic. And there's a difference. When you think apocalyptic, you need to think like Revelation with the nightmare monsters and all the destruction and all, you know, all that kind of stuff way over the top. But the, the persecution literature, there's a crisis, but it's not, you don't get the nightmare monsters. You don't have some of these other things going on. These passages in Mark are also about counseling us to have both hope and patience, which is a little different than what's going to happen. Apocalyptic literature is about ultimate victory, and these are that, but it's more about how to get through it than it is about holding steady and waiting for the end when everything will be destroyed. And I mean, there's a difference there. What this passage is telling us is that we're not supposed to be engaged in this, this 
rash, you know, apocalyptic fervor that they see all around them. We're not supposed to get caught up in the madness, which I thought was really ironic when I was, you know, studying this this week. And I thought, oh, well, that's interesting because haven't so many people been caught up in the madness in the last few weeks? We've seen it firsthand. We've seen what that looks like firsthand. All you have to do is walk into a grocery store or Target or Walmart and see all the signs that tell you you can only get so many of a certain item so that there's enough for everyone because we've forgotten how to share. We've forgotten how to, <laughs> how to take care of one another because we're so caught up in, in the fervor of what's going on that we've forgotten some of the basics of who we're supposed to be. This passage is also reminding us that there's going to be false prophets. There's going to be political turmoil. There's going to be a lot of mess going on and everything will, will, will feel slightly unmoored, will feel unsteady on our feet, but we're still to be engaged in mission. We're still to be doing that. Every time there's a major crisis, it always seems to bring a flood of, of books and movies and, and all sorts of things. Speakers who claim they have the evidence that this is it, that this is the end times, that, that the signs in Revelation are being fulfilled right this very minute. And that desire to use those apocalyptic prophecies, to use that literature, it's, it's concerning but it's also kind of natural. We're trying to make sense of upheaval. We're trying to make sense of what's going on. And that's one way to do it. Oh, that's it. This, this is the end. This is just the end. And for centuries, people have done this. Um, there was a whole group in the mid-1800s, the Millerites, that went on for years. And they kept changing the date because they kept passing it. And, you know, and nothing happened. And they were living communally. And everyone sold everything. And... If you remember back to 2011, um, Harold Campion, that whole, you know, it was what May 21st, 2011, I think was the, it was supposed to be when the world ended. Um, and that was a Saturday. And I just remember um, pastors joking, should I get a sermon ready for the next day or not? You know, should I even prepare for this? Because if it's all going to end, I just saved myself a lot of work this week. Um, I teased my husband because his birthday was just a couple days after that. And I'm like, oh, great, I don't have to get you a present this year. You know, because, well, the world's going to end. You know, so what? And we all knew it wasn't really going to end. But there were people who, so, who gave up their life savings, cashed in their 401ks to buy billboards to tell us all that the world was ending. And what Jesus is telling us here is we don't know when the end is. Not even Jesus knows when the end is. The angels in heaven don't know when the end is. The only one who knows is the Father. That's it. No one else knows. So when people try to, to find out and figure out that it, this is it, we don't know. We may never know. We don't know when it will come. It is not for us to know that. And isn't it better that way? Do we really want to know when the last day is? Think how frenzied and frantic people are now. Can you imagine what it would be like if we knew that on a certain date this is it? I mean, society would completely break down because, well, why would you work? Why would you do anything? Why not just party? Why not? All those things would happen because that's how we are. So what Jesus is telling us is our one concern is that we're supposed to be giving testimony to the gospel. We're supposed to be like the watchman at the door, ready and doing our job. It's not about trying to figure out what the date for the end times is. This is not a testimony. This is not a, a play by play. 
This is a reminder that we're supposed to be following as disciples all the way to the end. I mean, think about what's happening right now. I was just reading something this morning and it was showing pictures from different places in the world where everyone is sheltering in place. And so now you have, you know, like, wild animals coming down out of the mountains and wandering in the streets because there's no cars. There's no people to stop them. There's no one getting in the way. And so they're kind of taking things back. I said, I never thought about it, but when this all ends and we all can go back out to doing what we normally do, I think the number of you know wild animal attacks on people are gonna go through the roof because animals have just been wandering around um, in places they normally wouldn't have been. That wasn't something I thought about right away. You know, we've got enough books and literature that preparing us for the apocalypse. I've seen some of The Walking Dead. I mean, I've seen enough of these movies. Um, I remember reading some of the Left Behind series about 20 years ago. And yeah, it was that long ago now. It, ugh, I didn't need to remember that. It was that long. But I remember reading the first couple of these. And there were a whole bunch of them. And after about the second one, I started saying, how is it that no one seems to have any trouble finding gasoline? If half the world just disappeared, think about all the services that would be interrupted. How would you still be finding money? How would you still find gasoline? How would you still find supplies? Look at how messed up our supply chains are right now. And half the world isn't in hiding. There are portions of it, and portions of it are disrupted, but look at what's happened. In this particular case, because no one's traveling, gas prices are dropping because there's a glut in the market, but we can't find toilet paper. I didn't realize this was going to be the problem at the apocalypse was a lack of toilet paper. I mean, I never thought that was going to be the, the primary issue was finding toilet paper and hand sanitizer, but it seems to be. So could any of us have predicted this? Of course not. Of course not. And we shouldn't be. That shouldn't be what we're about. None of us knows God's plan for how things are going to end. We, we don't know when the end's going to happen for us as individuals or collectively as humanity. Jesus doesn't reveal the signs because he can't. Only the Father knows. And that's something that always kind of bothered me. That Mark's Jesus is very human. Of the four portrayals in the Gospels, Mark is the most human. So why is it that Jesus doesn't know so many things? And perhaps it comes down to this, I, if, you, I mean, if you think about it, Jesus is fully God, fully human. But you've put God into a human finite form. By definition, there's some things that aren't going to be possible. You know, we can't see all of time at the same time. We can only ever experience time sequentially. We can't be in multiple places at the same time. We can't do some of those things. So perhaps even some of that knowledge, because in a human form you could never fully deal with it you could never fully you know absorb it all that perhaps that's why Jesus in a human form doesn't know something to think about when God hasn't even told the angels doesn't that also mean that if you have some sort of apocalypse based on an angelic revelation wouldn't that be false as well because if the angels don't even know, how in the world could they be revealing it to us? I think the most important thing is we don't need to worry about it. We don't need to worry about all the apocalyptic speculation. Doing the will of God has no relationship to the timing of the end. To planners, those of us who like to plan and organize, you know, those who want to face the future with actuarial tables and, and economic indicators, these, these verses announce 
God's intervention in history to judge and to save. And to those who are disillusioned, whose faith and hope are, are restricted to the possibility of only human institutions, this text is predicting the destruction of institutions and calls for hope in the coming Son of Man. I mean, Jesus is warning us that the things are not how they may appear when it comes to the coming kingdom of God. That which seems most stable and reliable won't necessarily endure. None of the signs means that the reign of God has arrived. Just because there's an earthquake, just because there's a fire. I never thought I'd get to say this, just because there's a plague. <laughs> I mean, I have to say, as a student of history, I never thought those words would come out of my mouth. Just because there's a plague doesn't mean it's the end times. There are so many times in human history that have been so much more devastating than what we're dealing with right now. Someone asked me that a couple of months ago, and I said, well, if you think back, you know, when the Black Death went through, half the population was wiped out half and now we know there was another plague same plague but an earlier iteration of it in the 500s AD same thing half the populations wiped out you know 100 million people where do you even bury them all that's not an issue we're gonna have to deal with so the idea that just because a bad situation has happened right now it doesn't mean it's the end. Even John Calvin, who wrote commentaries on, you know, everything, opted to not write one, trying to elucidate all the inner workings of Revelation. Because as he put it, he didn't want to waste energy on idle speculation when it could be devoted to proclaiming the majesty and gospel of God. Which I thought was amazing that he didn't want to waste time on idle speculation the purpose of watching and waiting and observing is is to experience and be changed by something altogether different from what we've known up to this point it's to be transformed by something beyond ourselves that we can neither understand nor imagine these are Jesus' last words to us right before the Passion, the final message. You know, in this chapter, it's got all this prophecy, but it also has 19 different imperatives, 19 commands to the followers, commands about what faithful behavior looks like. No matter what comes, no matter what apparent delay there is in God's salvation. We are to live faithful and vigilant lives in the certainty that the Son will have the final victory over the chaos. Our job is to stay at our post. Our job is to be ready. Our job is to keep being disciples in whatever situations we get put in. We're not to ever stop being disciples. That's our job. We have more than enough gifts to work Christ's healing and hope in the world. More than enough. And in the giving of those gifts to others, the sharing of our gifts with others, that's where we find the peace of Christ that we seek. We are to stay at our post, to do our jobs, to be disciples in all places, no matter what happens. That's what we're to do. We're to wait and to watch and to be ready because we don't know when the hour will come. It may not come in any of our lifetimes. 2,000 years have passed and it still hasn't come. So the odds of it coming in the next couple of months, I think are pretty slim, but if it does, we're to be ready. That's the message of 
Jesus in Mark 13 is to be ready. Those are his final words. What I say to you, I say to all, keep awake, be ready. I think now we have a chance to reflect on that, to watch and to wait and to see how we can be the church and be disciples in a new day, in a new era, when everything seems to have changed and yet nothing important has. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this opportunity to be with your word. There are so many things that we don't know in this life. So many things that we prepare for and wait for and watch for. Help us be patient. Help us in the watching and in the waiting. Help us to be the disciples you created us to be. In spite of everything, in spite of all the changes, in spite of all the new behavior, in spite of all the new ways our society is trying to function, help us to still be disciples of your word in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would like to join with me, if you have the service order with you, let's share the profession of faith. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We are convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, we're going to continue like we did last week. I know we don't have an official time for taking up tithes and offerings, but it's still important that we give thanks to God and praise to God for all the different ways that we're able to share. So now please join in the doxology. join with me in the prayer of dedication. Gracious God, everything we have comes from you. You fill us with good things. Our hearts and lives overflow with your abundance. With thanksgiving, we bring to you our time, talent, and tithes. Use these gifts that you have given us to feed others as we have been fed, to serve others as we have been served, and to bless others as we have been blessed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we'll continue with the, the prayers of the people. Um, for, for privacy reasons, we're not listing all the prayers out on, on this since it's online. But, but those of you who received the, the worship materials got the, the prayer list. So just be sure to keep praying for, for all those on the prayer list. Um, a couple of notes of congratulations. Um, I know that Chuck Casson and Albert and Sharon Allen are back home, so back from Arizona. So hopefully the weather will behave for you here. I know it's been nice down there and, and there's no snow this year when you came back. So hey, that's a bonus, but we're glad that you're you're back with us in Iowa, and hopefully we'll all get to see you soon. Um, just continue to pray for for all those on the prayer list. Continue to pray for our, our leaders, both in the church, in the denomination. Um, they have a lot of big decis decisions to make in coming days. 
Um, we are supposed to be having a general assembly in June this year, and we're required, we're legally obligated, we have to have one in 2020. And they're trying to figure out what that's gonna look like. So prayers for them and for ways to, to figure that out. Um, we discovered this week that where the GA is supposed to be held in Baltimore has now been uh, taken over as a field hospital. So <laughs> it's gonna be a little tough to be in there. So they're trying to figure out what we do going forward. Um, but just remember all those on the list in your prayers this week. Um, and definitely remember all of our leaders because this is a very difficult time for all of them. Um, there are lots of decisions to be made that are not popular. Um, many people are of our leaders are stuck in the, you know, there's a no-win situation. And so they're trying to do the best they can. And the, the least we can do is to pray for them for wisdom in the days ahead. So let's take a moment and let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we, we thank you for this chance to gather together, even if we can't be together in person. We give you thanks for the chance to lift one another up in prayer, to lift up our brothers and sisters who are in need of your strength, who are in need of your love, who are in need of your spirit. We pray for our leaders here and around the world that they make good decisions, that they keep people safe. We pray that all people find a, a new source of patience, that we all find ways to adapt to this new reality. We lift up to you those needs that we carry deepest within our hearts. We thank you for the reminders that spring is here, the new buds forming on the trees, the warmer weather, the grass and the flowers that are just starting to show their green. Thank you for the reminder that life still flourishes. Be with those who are working on the front lines, all the medical staff, all the emergency workers, all those workers who are still putting themselves out there, being with each other making sure that life goes on for the rest of us. Be with each of us. Remind us that we are not alone. Remind us that we are all loved. And help us find new ways to be disciples each and every day. We pray all this in the strong name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now our closing hymn is hymn number 543, but it's the words are there in the bulletin, Abide With Me.
Now before we go, just a quick reminder that the the Lenten studies are, are coming. There's devotionals coming, to, you know, try to get them out every day. I'm still trying to get us caught up so we're there by Easter time. Um, we will have a couple of services for, I will post live for Monday, Thursday and Good Friday. So there will be services for those two online. Uh, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. If the palms come, you might find one on your doorstep. Um, there might be a couple of us who do a mad dash around. Um, if they don't, because of shipping issues, they might not get here because we couldn't cancel them. If they don't, um, then I would say, you know, you can make some out of paper, you know, just put lots of little clips around some paper and make your own palm leaves to wave. Um, we'll have some here that we'll make. I think I'll get Katie on that. It's a good project for her this week. So we'll have palms that we'll wave too on this end next Sunday. So it'll still be Palm Sunday. We'll still have lots of alleluias, and it will be a good time. Now for the charge and benediction. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being there. Christ lives in you and has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go in the grace and the love and the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace, and we'll see you soon.